what I've been telling you. Nothing like it seems is what I've been telling you. Oh, you'd learn what I mean if you came. But the risk are you living it day? Good afternoon. I give you the wave, not a wave, just the wave, the regular wave. Do you ever feel like your logo is right in the middle of your face? That's better. <laughs> Guess I'll go over here. Hey, good e afternoon, friends, family. Country people, international people. Hi, Susan. Good to see you. Digitally. Uh, and Mandy. Hi. Did they get that? Did they get the eyes in there correctly, Mandy? Good. Good. Or maybe you're telling me you're watching from Hawaii. But I think that's not true. What's up, Mercy Untamed? Glad you're here. I'm loving seeing all these YouTubers. I'm thinking about that today. I almost, I'm not Susan, don't panic, but I almost considered just shifting entirely to YouTube and away from Facebook. But I'm not doing that now, at least not yet. But if I do go to YouTube, all you Facebookers, it's easy to follow. Um, hello, Captain Sarah. Wait, that was Mercy Untamed again. How did that, word Captain Sarah, uh, that one? Yes. Hi, Captain Sarah. Wonderful. How do you, hey, Floyd! What's up, buddy? It's good to see you on here. Glad you're hanging out for the afternoon or for as long as you can. It's good to have you. What's up, Mike Chrisman? Glad you're here. Glad you are all here. If you are watching this, speaking of the Facebooks, if you're on the Facebook and you want to click share, that's what I just did. I was on my phone and I, because I stream this through my author page and then I share it with my personal page. So if you want to share it, sharing is caring. I learned that in kindy, kindergarten. Uh, okay, good. Susan, you do have YouTube. So that if I do transition there, you can still hang. Um... Uh, who else we got here? We got Jesse saying uh, hi. Jesse, that was not as many eyes as Mandy. So, not think it's a competition, but if it was, you lost. Glad you're here for part two. I'm also excited for part two. And I'm probably gonna do, well, I am definitely gonna do part three. I always do that. I'll be like, I'll just write this one thing. Well, maybe two, well, maybe three. I don't know, we're gonna get going here and. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Perspective Shift with me, your host, Colby Brenneman. Martin, ooh, throwing in the middle name there. That's exciting. I don't uh, do that very often, but it just came to me. That's right. My middle name is Brenneman. It's a family name. I believe, don't get mad at me, mom. I believe it's my grandpa on my dad's side's mom's maiden name, right? So that'd be my great grandma, great grandma Martin's maiden name. Sounds about right. And it's then also the middle name we passed on to our fourth son, that's the end of that story. Anyway, welcome to Perspective Shift. This is my uh, this is my weekly show that is inspired by my weekly newsletter that you can get by subscribing to that URL that just scrolled past me, but it'll come back. It starts over here. Uh, ColbyMartin.Substack.com. If you go there and type in your email address, then you will have officially subscribed. And then on Wednesday mornings, I will deliver to your inbox personally. I will show up outside your house and tap into your router and drop in my electronic mail into your inbox, um, This these articles that I write. And what do I write about? Well, oftentimes it is this sort of interplay of religion, spirituality, and psychology. 
that's kind of my main topics, main themes that I hit on. Those are the things that I'm passionate about. Those are, if I have any expertise in anything, those I guess are the things I have expertise in, expertise, ex, expertise. I have expertise in that. Uh, and then I hop on here on Wednesdays to join you all, to join people like Phil Spencer. What's up, Phil Spencer? Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Jesse Hawkins, who's doing some cross greetings to Mercy and to Susan. See, we've, we're building our own little community here. So if this is your first time hanging out with me on Wednesday afternoons, you are welcome here. You too can get a high from Jesse Hawkins. You never know. Uh, yes, it is always a competition with me, Jesse, as an Enneagram type three. <laughs> I try to not have things be competitions, but they always are. Hey, speaking of competitions, I'm curious, are any of you watching the Super Bowls this Sunday? If so, let me know and let me know who you're rooting for. I used to be a ra ra rabid, rav ra ra rapid, rabid, rabid, a fan. I used to be a great fan. <laughs> I like words, and then every once in a while I can't think of them. I used to be a, a great fan of the footballs, uh, but then about four or five years ago, I had sort of reached the limit that I could handle on the number of ways in which specifically the NFL violated my conscience. Uh, things such as the way that uh, CTE concussions um, just damaging these young men's brains, things like the violence against women in the league was hardly punished. So a guy would smoke weed and get suspended for a year, and then he'd beat up his girlfriend and miss two games. Just this cavalier attitude towards that. Um, and the, But the one that finally broke the straw was then Colin Kaepernick, um, protesting police brutality by kneeling on the uh, the anthem and just the way that the league responded to that and has essentially blackballed Colin from the league. And I just had enough. I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I supporting this league with anything? So I walked away from the NFL like three or four years ago. Um, now the games kind of bore me. Like every every once in a while, I'll turn on something. I'm like, man, give me some NBA. Uh, but the Super Bowl is still fun. It's still, still a fun cultural event, so we will be watching it this Sunday. Uh, Angelo says it's rabid. Thank you. I think that <laughs> I think you are right. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> not a rapid fan. Not a quick fan. Rabid. Rabid fan. Uh, Mandy representing the Chiefs. Uh, Patty Mahomes. I hear he's good, but not quite as good as the goat. Right? Isn't isn't T Brady the goat? Um, yeah, James, I imagine you would be rooting for Brady. You and me, old schoolers, want to see that old man do well one last time. Uh, oh, got a couple more folks saying hi. Pastor Nar, happy Wednesday to you. What's up, Junior? Glad you came back, buddy. It's good to see you here. All right. Uh, and then you might hear loudness upstairs because that I have children and it's the middle of the day. So that's how we roll. Okay. I'm going to dive in here. So here's what I do. Uh, if this is your first time joining me here at Perspective Shift and my iPad went to sleep, come back to me, is I go now. Actually, let me, before I do that, I want to tell you about two things. Uh, one is tonight. Look at that. Tonight, um, my wife and I do a live show called The Kate and Colby Show. It's a podcast that we've turned into a live show. And tonight we're going to have a special guest, Brian freaking McLaren. I don't know if that's his official middle name, but that's what I call him. And I like to tell people that no author has had a greater impact on my life than Brian. I just love this guy. And so he's going to join uh, Kate and myself live tonight on our show at 7 p.m. Pacific. So just make sure you go to the Kate and Colby's uh, YouTube channel, subscribe, Facebook page, like, uh, and then come back 7 p.m. tonight. going to be super fun. And if you do join us live, then you get the chance to win we're giving away three of these, three of Brian's new book called Faith After Doubt, Why Your Beliefs Stopped Working and What to Do About It. So we've got three copies that we're going to give away to you, but you got to tune in live. You can't after the fact or before the fact enter. That's the only way you can enter. And then uh, speaking of the subscribes and the likes, I would love it if you're watching this on YouTube, if you would go ahead and click subscribe to my channel. And if you're watching on the Facebooks, I'd love if you liked my page on the Facebooks. And I kind of see this as a win-win. One, it helps me know that you're out there and you care. Um, and that matters to me. And then, but it's a win for you because then when I put out content or go live, then it lets you know that that's happening. So you don't miss it. So that'd be great. I'd love that. Okay. Those are my two little announcements out of the way. 
Uh, Mercy wants to know if I can rig it so that you can get a free book. I can neither confirm nor deny if rigging will happen. Um, Christian, yay, you're here. I'm excited that you are here in time as well. We've got another Chiefs fans just to go back to wrap that up. Rooting for the Chiefs. I'm a Pittsburgh native and we are not Brady fans. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> and yes, sounds like you relate a little bit to what I was saying about the NFL and the moral of it all. But Super Bowl, I guess, make an exception. That is that is life. If life is life is nothing if not a constant navigation of conflicting values. Isn't it? I feel like that's a pretty good summation of what it means to be a human. We have our sets of values that we sort of build up and acquire and curate over time through a combination of our upbringing and the media that we consume and the books that we read and the religion that we're part of. And we have all these values. Uh, in fact, it's going to dovetail nicely into what we're going to talk about here today. We have all these values, but the reality is, is we just can't live them all out consistently 100% of the time. And so we have to make choices from time to time uh, on which value we are going to elevate more than another. So for me, I don't watch football anymore, but when it comes to the Super Bowl, uh, like, well, all right, good. Well, that little mini sermon's out of the way. Yes. Thank you, Mandy. You understand what I'm talking about. Uh, Andrew, glad you're back, man. Um, yes, not a big NFL fan of myself. I hear you. And also Super Bowl. I don't know. Uh, it's going to be weird this year, though, because the fan, like, what the stadium will be like one tenth full or something i don't know but uh, anyway life is just weird okay let's go to now this scene here where i put my little ipad up here on the window and you know again if this if you're just joining me if you want to go to this url here colbymartin.substack.com you can subscribe to get these newsletters free in your inbox or just set a reminder to hop on here at 2 p.m on wednesdays and we're going to go through it together live so here we go Last week, if you were with us or if you read the article from last week, I, I started exploring this topic of the authority of the Bible, uh, fancy term sola scriptura, the, the authority of scripture alone. And so um, I knew that it was going to be longer than I could tackle in one article. So I said it's at least going to be two parts, which it is here, and now it's going to be at least three. I'm going to carry it over to next week, and we'll just see where it goes from there. So this is the authority of the Bible continued part two, what it means to be under a thing's authority. And what I say is if you, I'm seeing all your comments here from the Facebooks and the YouTubes. And if you have any comments or questions or as we go along, I do pause periodically and I would love to interact with you so that this is not just a one way uh, monologue. Although I love myself a good monologue. Maybe that's why I like Aaron Sorkin shows. All right, here we go. And it starts like this, six authoritative truths in my life. The beginning again, when we've lost focus, that's the whole point. Sharon Salzberg. It all belongs, Richard Rohr. Be brave because you're a child of God and be kind because so is everyone else. Glennon Doyle. Understanding leads to compassion and compassion leads to love. Thich Nhat Hanh. Hatred bears deadly and bitter fruit. Howard Thurman. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus. These six quotes, or summation of their ideas, represent six of the most important insights that have shaped my life. They guide me in the ways of compassion and grace and love and forgiveness. They function as compasses, pointing me in good directions when life gets complicated. Even to go back to what I was saying a minute ago about the conflicting of values. These are the sorts of truths and insights that help me navigate those moments. You might say then that these truths are rules that govern how I conduct myself. Or perhaps I might say it like this. These ideas, these truths, these teachings have, quote, authority in my life. Which is to say that I have, one, acknowledged the power of these ideas, two, accepted their wisdom, their tried and true, tested wisdom, and three, I have placed myself as a result 
under the authority of their truthiness. Which means what exactly? What does under the authority of mean? Well, it means that when conducting my life, and when I'm confronted with different options on how to proceed in any given moment, while I might have a range of possibilities in front of me, the only viable options are those that align with the direction and fit within the parameters of these guiding principles and the values that I stated above. Because I have willingly acquiesced to the authority of these ideas via my deep awareness of how true and powerful and wise they are, because of this, um, behaviors that run counter to these ideas, you might say, are just not permissible for me. And so I give three examples to try to illustrate what I mean by that these ideas, these teachings, these truths have an authoritative place in my life so that should I want to consider doing this thing or this thing, this authority says to me, nope, that's not available to you, that's not available to you, this is what you ought to do. So I might, for example, like I wrote about uh, many months ago in my series on hatred, I might really, really want to harbor hate in my heart towards someone. Pretty human, happens a lot. But because I have placed myself under the authority of this truth that hatred bears deadly fruit, I'm not permitted to. It's just, it's not an option that's available to me based on my decision to allow this truth and the wisdom and the power therein to have, quote, authority in my life. Or I might really want to feel bad and really just soak into a pity party of guilt about past iterations of myself, like what I used to believe and how I used to treat people. And I write about that in chapter nine of my book, The Shift. But because I placed myself under the authority of the truth that it all belongs, I'm not permitted to. All the past seasons and iterations of myself, it, it all belongs. It all is part of it. And that stops me from those spirals of being like, oh my God, I used to believe that. I used to, oh, I used to treat people like, oh, I'm just the worst. Oh, so embarrassing. No, it all belongs. Moving on. Or another example is I might really want to just sort of silo myself into a bubble of progressivism and continue to judge and demonize those that are on the right. But because I place myself under the authority of be kind, because everyone is a child of God, as well as Thich Nhat Hanh's understanding leads to compassion and compassion leads to love, as well as Jesus' teaching to love your neighbor as yourself, y'all, I'm not allowed that sort of self-indulgent, self-righteous, arrogant posture. And so this to me is what it means to submit under the authority of something. So I'll pause there um, and look at a few. Gra oh, well, I'll just answer the real easy questions right here. Like Lenny, Lenny's on topic today. <laughs> Your graphics look like mine. <laughs> um, do you use Canva? Sometimes I'm curious what on the screen looked. I don't think anything on here is Canva-ish. Uh, I made that with the logo creator and Photoshop. I made that with Keynote. This is just a PNG of an iMac. Anyway, um, but yes, I do like Canva. I do use Canva. From, it's one of the four tools that I use. Uh, Junior says, do we ever start off these sessions with prayer? I do not start off these sessions with prayer unless you consider like uh, the Apostle Paul who prays without ceasing. And everything is prayer. So then in that way, yes. But no, not a formal session of prayer. Uh, and Mandy, I think what I hear is grace for yourself and others, which is what Jesus would do. Yeah, well, you, that sounds like a very wise, authoritative truth to place yourself under, Mandy. Grace for yourself and for others. Um, but yeah, hopefully you're picking up what I'm putting down a little bit so far when I talk about what does it mean to have authority? That there are, that you can... And I'll talk about this a little bit at the end of the hour today and then next week. You can, so I describe it as opting in to say, yes, this thing has authority in my life, which is to say that it provides these boundaries, these parameters, this direction by which um, I live my life. And so I started off by just naming six of those truths uh, that 
provide authority in my life, if you will. So I'm trying to just describe here what it means, what it might mean that a, that an idea or a teaching or a person, some sort of phenomena has authority in your life. It means that there are certain, that if it's counter to that, that that's not permissible for you. And by not permissible, I simply, all I mean by that is if you do those things outside of that parameter, then you are sort of rebelling against your own internal decision to have this thing be as an authority in your life. I don't know how much sense that made. Um, Andrew, Andrew says, as you conduct your life, let's see if I can get these to stop going off the screen like that. As you conduct your life as a pastor, what you are ultimately what you're ultimately in pursuit of. Is it to orient your life around your six subjective quotes? Uh, or are you more interested in something like knowing God, becoming like Jesus, connecting with spirituality? Um, okay. So we get impersonal. And that's fine. I'm putting myself out there. So I'm open to that. But I also reserve the right to not always answer those sort of questions. What am I in pursuit of? You say as you conduct your life as a pastor... So I think right there, I might pull back a little bit and say, I don't conduct my life as a pastor. A pastor is just one of the roles that I um, perform. It's one of the unique callings in my life that I have said yes to and that I have that I show up to. But it is not my life. It is not who I am. Who I am is just the truest thing is that I'm a loved child of God, full stop. But what I do from there is, is really up to me. Um, so when I think about the fact that I'm, that I have said yes to this calling of a pastor, I am aware that there are sort of added responsibilities to that calling, both culturally, there's a lot of cultural baggage with what it means to be a pastor. And a lot of it, I don't, um, a lot of it I just sort of ignore, like, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna crush myself under the weight of these cultural ideas of what it means to be a pastor. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be perfect. I'm not gonna have answers for people. Um, I'm not gonna say everything right. Like there are just there's expectations that that people have put on pastors that I have been crushed under the weight of for long enough. And I'm like, nah, I, I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing and that's part of when Kate and I, my wife and I started our church seven years ago, that was one of our like clear values from the get-go is, look, we are not going to, we're not going to be on a pedestal. We ain't better than anybody. And we're not going to do the dance of that. Um, but to go into your question, so what is, what is my, what's the pursuit of my life? And you say, is it to orient your life around your six subjective quotes? Can't tell if your use of the word subjective there was a little bit of a jab, but also it's just true. Those, uh, I, I, those are just the ones that have made a significant impact in my life. So they're subjective to me. Or are you more interested in something like knowing God, becoming like Jesus, connecting to spirituality, et cetera? Uh, I reject the dualism of that question, Andrew. So I'm going to put it back up there just so that people know what I'm talking about. There's a there's a do there's a sort of a binary in this question. Is it either to orient your life around those quotes, or are you more interested in things like knowing God, becoming like Jesus? I don't. Those aren't ors for me. Those are ands for me. Um, those those quotes that I shared are certainly not an exhaustive list. They're just over the last few years things that have I have given myself um, under the authority of their truth and their wisdom and their 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 goodness. And so when I am, you know, you talked about things like knowing God, becoming like Jesus, connecting with spirituality. All of that for me is just part of what it means to be human. And as I sort of go throughout my life, I need to make sure that everyone is a love child, that I remember everyone's a love ch child of God. I need to remember that hatred is a deadly fruit. I need to remember that that I am called to love my neighbor as myself, et cetera. So those are like the values of how I shape my life. And then, I don't know, knowing God, becoming like Jesus. Yeah, I do those things too. So I don't know that fully answered your question, but I think in part because I don't really agree with your question. Uh, and no, you don't have to apologize for jumping in so deep, so fast. You're totally fine. Um, and yes, I do describe myself as a pastor. I, would, no, you're, I didn't mean to say you did anything wrong with your question. I just wasn't necessarily prepared to go into that topic, but I'm always open to, I'm sometimes open to most topics. <laughs> I almost caught myself in something I didn't believe there. Um, and your church, was these live streams in your, in your home church? 
I'm not sure what the quote marks around church is for, but uh, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Um, checking back here. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Jesse says, and the fact that I'm refusing to be crushed by those cultural ideas and expectations of what a pastor is makes me a great pastor. I really appreciate that, man. It means a lot. Um, Melanie says that I've chosen six quotes that are admirable and show my love for God. Thank you. What of those... What of those who choose harmful values as their authority? How are you reach? Yeah. Okay. So there's a great question. What about those who have placed their themselves under the authority of what might rightly be judged to be harmful values? Um, people who live their lives with ideas and teachings that they have decided is true for them and good for them and right. And so they live their lives with these truths. And Melanie's question is, okay, but that's cool and all like everybody. Yeah, great, great, great. You, but also what if those are like super harmful? And, uh, and Melanie, that's, you have just sort of named like the, the, the place in which I do a lot of, or I try to do a lot of my work, my, my public work, which is to sort of join in the long tradition of prophetically speaking against my own religious tradition when there are harmful ideas out there and when there are harmful teachings out there. So for me, part of how I handle that, it, Melanie, is that I use whatever platforms I have, whatever influence I have to name these, these ideas and beliefs as harmful as best as I can. And try to at times teach as to why that is. And at other times just straight up be like, yo, that will lead to death and destruction. Um, please stop listening to that. <laughs> that is not true. That is not good. That is not beneficial. So that's my calling. Now, how do others reach across that divide? Uh, I think that's I think that's going to be dependent on so many factors. Sometimes, okay, here's an interesting thought, Melanie, is that I think that within at least the sort of the conservative evangelicalism that I came from, there is this expectation that part of what it means to be a Christian is to be sort of constantly sort of trying to reach across the divide, as you described it, or, or seeking reconciliation, being bridge builders. And I think that those are all wonderful, noble endeavors, but I don't think it's necessarily everyone's uh, calling and or everyone's role and or everyone's role all the time. So there might be seasons, just for instance, you, there might be seasons in your life, Melanie, where the best thing you can do is like when Jesus told his disciples, you know, as you go from village to village announcing the kingdom of God, and if people reject you and reject your message, then shake the dust off your feet and move on. Like this is, I, I take that as this divine permission slip to accept people's rejection and not, I'm not going to keep like knocking on the door. No, like if you rejected, then I'm going to move on. Um, and I think that that option is available to us sometimes. So sometimes in terms of trying to cross the divide, like you said, some, it might be like, you know what? I, this is like pearls before swine. So maybe if I'll give myself permission for this season to not try to reach across the divide. There's just no, no good is coming out of it. And then maybe down the road, there'll be an, another potential opportunity or a season changes where, um, where yeah, that, that conversational door opens up and be like, oh, I'd, I'd love to share with you now why I think your ideas are harmful. <laughs> and in between those two seasons, my hope is that we can continue to conduct ourselves as non-judging, um, loving, compassionate people that are good listeners so that when our adversaries or when the people that are very different from us want to have a conversation, they know that we are safe people to do that because we've demonstrated this loving, open, compassionate ear. Those are a few things that come to mind. Uh, great question. All right. Um, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, I, I. You're right. Writing here is hard. I just mean subject. He says I just mean subjectively in the sense that we could all have different quotes. Like, where do they come from? Yeah. I get. I. I did really try to give you the benefit of the doubt, um, but I've also been navigating a lot of really uncharitable. <laughs> comments on the interwebs lately. So it's hard for me sometimes to sift through, is this coming from a place of sincerity or are there barbs in here? But thank you for clarifying that. I really appreciate that. I like your spirit a lot, Andrew. 
Uh, pastor Nara, thanks, man. He says, from one pastor to another, well said about being a pastor. And beautiful role is but one role. Yes. Yes. I'm with you. Um, Lenny, Lenny says, being a pastor, minister, or any lay leader is simply just a part of your identity and who you are, but not completely. This is because your identity is many things that make you who you are and who you are becoming. For example, being gay is part of my identity, but it isn't who I am completely. I love it. Thank you for adding that in, Lenny. I love having you here. Um, hey, Massage Works. Good to have you. Sorry, I'm catching up on comments here. We got a bit of a bit of a tangent going on, uh, but we'll get back to the article here in a minute. Uh, da, 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 da. Just catch back up, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, good, Melanie. I'm glad the shake and the dust off your feet resonated with you. I have a whole chapter on that in, by the way, in my book, The Shift that came out last year, I have a whole chapter on shaking the dust and sort of unpacking that more and how I think that's a really appropriate and wise and good path for people to take sometimes. Uh, and Jesse liked that. Divine permission slip. Good. Write that down. Slap it on a coffee mug. Actually, don't. I don't know that it's good enough for a $30 custom mug. Okay, let's go back to the article. How sh how how's that sound? Authority has the last word is the next header here. So to speak of the authority of something is to identify how a particular phenomenon, whether it's a person or a law or an idea, uh, how it occupies a position of premier influence in a person's life. More plainly said, it gets the last word. This is what it means that for a thing to have authority. It just it gets the last word. So the examples that I shared earlier illustrate how the authority of these ideas, uh, how they work in my life. I place myself under the governance of these truths in such a way that that they have not just a meaningful impact on my life. It's not just that they've inspired me, although they have done that, but even more than that, they contribute to things like guiding me, shaping me, and at times correcting me. Authoritative sources can tell us what to do, which is what I mean by guide us, how to do it, which is how to talk about shaping us, and to help us know when we're screwing it up. This idea of, of correction. I grew up playing sports um, for my entire childhood and young uh, adulthood. And I learned quickly in that world what it meant to come under the authority of the coach. Coach says, run one more lap, you run another lap. Coach says, show up at 7.30 a.m. for practice, we showed up. Coach says, stop eating crappy food and start drinking more water. And we tried to stop eating crappy food and drinking more water. Uh, last week, I wrote about the notion of sola scriptura, how that for some people, the Bible occupies this position of sole authority in their life. The Bible is their coach, if you will, guiding and shaping and correcting their life. And this sort of authority for many Christians, and I would say for most evangelicals, is seen as supreme. So if the Bible ever disagrees with other people or other sources, or flip that around, if other sources or people disagree with what the Bible says, be it evolutionary biologists or historians or psychologists, uh, for those who adapt this strict authority of the Bible stance, the Bible will always win. It always gets the biggest and the last word. Or as one article that I read this week on creation.com puts it, quote, believing scripture to be inerrant, we judge the claims of secular historians and archaeologists against this record. So the idea of sola scriptura and the authority of the Bible in this way is that if anything has any sort of challenge or contradictory or um, alternative ideas than the uh, against the Bible, those who who adhere to a strict sola scriptura authority of the Bible, it, the Bible always wins, always gets the last word. Um, now, I, as I've shared on here and as I've written about elsewhere, I find the position of the inerrancy of scripture and the infallibility of scripture to be untenable positions, which is to say that once you actually scrutinize what that means and look at it with any, my opinion, any degree of like honest scholarship and curiosity, quickly you discover that, no, of course the Bible's not inerrant. And this isn't a bad thing, by the way. This is not a negative judgment against it. 
part of what I think we talked about last week was how the Bible doesn't even make these claims about itself. These are claims that have been made about it. So then we can just sort of unclaim these things. Um, so then here's the final, I believe this is the final se section. So I'll just read this and then, and then go to any comments or questions here. So then opting into the authority of the Bible. So as I acknowledged last week, if it, I acknowledge this, like if you believe that God truly, actually, literally authored the Bible in the sense that the words on the papyrus perfectly reflect the ideas and the thoughts of God, if this is your, um, if this, if this is how you believe the Bible came to be, then uh, yeah, it kind of makes sense to me that you would be like, oh, well, we shouldn't argue with God. And this is what God clearly said. So so my, my, my point is, is I go back to that Thich Nhat Hanh, understanding leads to compassion, compassion leads to love, trying to understand those who have this view. If if a person really believes that everything that are that is in this Bible is like, I don't know how else to say it, literally and actually the ideas and the thoughts of God as though God, God's self had a pen and wrote the thing out. Then from there, I can understand, because I, again, it's not just understanding, I lived it, but I can understand then how a person would be like, yeah, we got to come under the authority of that because God quite literally said all these things. That posture makes sense to me. So viewed in this way, submitting to the authority of the Bible, it makes sense. I mean, does it get any more authoritative than the creator of everything? If anyone is going to have wise or good or true ideas, it's God, him or they. So scoffing at people who then don't submit to such authority almost seems reasonable. Like what, you don't submit to the authority of the Bible? And what's behind that is because isn't the Bible like the actual literal words of the ideas of the creator of everything? But once you move past these beliefs, as I would encourage people to be open to the possibility of, and once you move past these beliefs about the Bible, suddenly the idea of it having this authoritative place in your life becomes, I guess, optional is how I would say it. Optional. If the words in these 66 books in the Bible are not exact and precise utterances of God, then it seems to me that we are invited to a sort of posture that may or may not to submit to some parts and not others. And that's what I'll write about next week. I'll get, I'll get more specific with my own life, some of the ways in which I've opted into the authority of the Bible. And I'm also going to explain why I think that this opting in is actually in some ways related to my many layers of privilege. And I'll explain that next week. Okay. All right, that has that's the end of the article, and I just want to, while I've got you here, um, see if there's any new visitors or viewers, you can go to this URL here, colbymartin.substack.com, and read this article, and then subscribe to my newsletter. And also, if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and click that little subscribe button. That would really help me out. And or if you are watching this on the Facebooks, would you uh, make sure to like my uh, my page as well. That would help me out. Okay, so that is the conclusion of this article. The rest of this is just inviting you to come join me. That's, uh, yep, 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 yep. Oh, and this is another reminder. Tonight, y'all, come back. Come back tonight, 7 p.m., Kate and Colby Show. Brian McLaren's going to be live, and you have a chance to win a free copy of his book if you join us live. Okay, let me get that off the screen and go back to this. Um, I did not know those were both going to show up, but they did. That was fun. Another reminder, like and subscribe. All right, I'm going to just check in here with comments and questions and uh, see if anybody has any thoughts on what I what we've talked about here today so far. Um, Dylan's showing up. What's up, Dylan? Glad you're here, man. Um, yes, Captain Sarah acknowledges this beautiful acronym, uh, the B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. There was like a 90s contemporary Christian song about that. I'm pretty sure I butchered the melody, but I do remember that there was a song about that. Uh, Christian asks, how do people learn to differentiate between good and bad authority? I'm thinking about people who grew up with harmful teachings and never left the bubble. Is it okay, Christian, if my first response to that is, I don't know. I don't know. So when I, 
when I think back about my own life, and I kind of try to reverse engineer the trajectory of this staunch, conservative, evangelical, um, and now 15 years later, very much not that. I, yeah, I can point to a few pivotal moments that helped, that were like these, 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 uh, sort of transitional catalysts. And I mentioned it earlier, by the way, that the writings of Brian McLaren was one such catalyst, but a lot of times, Christian, I look back at that and I, and the only word I kind of fall back on is, is grace. Like why, why, why was I, why was I open to questions when others were not? Why was I willing to suspend belief long enough to get curious about things when others were sort of hunkered down in their fear and insecurity? I don't know. I, I certainly don't want to take more credit than I deserve, which is uh, very little, if, if, if any at all. Uh, but grace, man, it's just, for me, it's like, what a freaking gift uh, that I have been carried along the river that I've been carried along. Maybe this is part of why I describe faith as having this posture of openness, to be willing to, 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 to this sense that out there is a light and we are constantly sort of turning to that light, open to the possibility that the light can change us and that change is good. So I'm not entirely sure how someone sort of escapes the bubble, how they can get to a point where they act, where they begin to investigate. Am I holding on to any harmful beliefs? I mean, because nobody does this willingly. By the like, by the way, uh, nobody holds on to foundational values and ideas knowing that they're harmful. It's only, you know, when I, when I, let's just take an example here. Um, so for me, the idea that to, to be gay or lesbian is an abomination to God is like a, a disorder is somehow broken. This idea, uh, is flat out, flat out wrong and extremely harmful. And yet I am aware that those, the majority of conservative Christians who hold these ideas don't hold them while believing that they're harmful. They don't think they're harmful. Though when they, when they begin to realize the harm of these ideas, that is like this 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 little tiny lever that unlocks these little caverns in their heart be like damn that wait a minute people are are dying because of these beliefs people are people's lives are are full of shame and suffering because of these beliefs maybe i should investigate those beliefs <laughs> right and so then that can lead to the change of mind but but i don't think people knowingly or willingly choose harmful ideas so again, this is all trying to respond to Christian's really good question. How do people learn to differentiate between good and bad authority? People who grew up with harmful teachings and never left the bubble. This is when I, I really think that people would do well to consider sources of truth outside the Bible. Because if you'll indulge me for a minute here, the authors of the Bible writing somewhere between two and three and a half thousand years ago are not the pinnacle of wisdom and insight into human psychology and well-being. We've learned some things, y'all, in the last 2,000 years. I'm not saying they were stupid and we're smart. No, in many ways, our ancient forefathers and foremothers had wisdom way beyond that of us modern ignoramuses. But also, we've learned, like, we know some things now about trauma, for instance, and trauma recovery and mental well-being. Like we know, we know these things and I, and I'm, I'm not going to stand, I'm not going to suggest to you that the apostle Paul, um, knew more about human psychology and well-being than we do now. No, no. So it, it might be a good idea for us to 
to investigate some of our ideas that and some of these authoritative truths that we have put ourselves under that come from the Bible, it might be a good idea to hold those up against some other uh, ways of knowing and listening to other people's stories and and their truths and allow that to sort of shape and maybe unlock some of these um, ideas that might be harmful. Okay, that's such a good question. I don't I don't know how good my response was. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to self-deprecate. It was a great response. I'm proud of that response. Okay, moving on. Uh, Massage Works points out what I often like to point out as well, that this idea of scripture, like literal interpretation of scripture is a relatively new thing. It really is. It really is. Um, so many of my evangelical brothers and sisters and siblings and family members would do well to hear that. But they don't hear me when I say it for some reason. Um, Dylan writes, on the last chapter of Unclobber. Oh, cool. I hope you enjoy the ending. Uh, my religious beliefs has introduced me to what I know experience anxiety, and it's been horrible. At the same time, I tried to understand myself more. I'm so sorry about the, the way that religious ideas creates in people unnecessary suffering and anxiety and shame. I'm so sorry. Um, and I'm honored to be any part. If there's any way that I could play any role in people's lives of, of freeing them from some of that anxiety and fear and shame and insecurity. Oh, talk about grace. What a gift. Um, trying to catch up here. Uh, Junior is reminding me that I said I would explain why I believe Genesis is purely an allegorical account and a story, a work of fiction. Uh, did I say I was going to do that today? I don't remember. I might have, I might have thought I would get farther down my series on the authority of the Bible than I did. I didn't. I only got as far as the talk, kind of about that word authority. So again, we'll just have to put a pin in that. Um, da -da oh, sorry. I think I talked for a long time, and then a lot more comments and questions came in. So I'm just playing a little bit of catch up here. A little bit of mustard's best friend. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Yeah, Mandy hits it on the head. I think no one is intentionally being harmful with their beliefs. They're doing the best they, they can. Takes it all. Yeah, I, I I love Brene Brown's teaching that everyone is doing the best they can. Which may not actually be true. I think it's more true than we probably think it is sometimes. But even if it's not all the way true, I think there is great value for us starting from that place it softens us and when we're softened um, that opens up possibility for connection with others whereas if we start from this place of you ain't doing the best you're you're lazy or ignorant or stupid or cruel or whatever it is start from that place yeah good luck trying to connect with anybody um yeah massage massage works that's another way to get out of the bubble just get kicked out of it i'm sorry brother <laughs> I'm not laughing. It's not funny. I just, it's the, it's just, it's absurd. It's absurd to me. It's absurd and it's harmful and it's ridiculous that this movement, God, talk about tangents, this movement that Jesus started, which was about uh, bringing more and more and more and more people into this awareness that we are all love children of God. Like, he got this thing rolling and then the early church took it and ran with it. They're like, oh damn, like I think he's on to something. Even the gen even the Gentiles? What? And then you have that story in Acts 8 with Philip and the, the Ethiopian eunuch, which fun fact, eunuch is a, just was an umbrella term that covered three varieties of people in the ancient world. One, castrated male, we know that. Two, uh, um, a male who chose celibacy for the sake of whatever, might be religious or political, but who chose sort of a, a chosen eunuch. And then three is what they called a natural eunuch. A natural eunuch was a guy who had all the plumbing that was needed for procreation, but just wasn't interested in women. And so we have this Ethiopian eunuch who then is reading this scroll from Isaiah and asks Philip, hey, do you know what's going on here in this, this book of yours, book of your people's? And Philip's like, oh, let me show you. Uh, let's talk about what, this suffering servant. Let's talk about this idea of, of, of love sort of laying itself down for others and, and teaches this Ethiopian eunuch about the, the, the 
the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and then baptizes. And so you have this gorgeous moment of this opening, this, this constant expansion of Gentiles and women, and then even the sexual other. Like, ev- like my point is, is this early movement was all about go get everybody, go get everybody, and let them know that they're all loved children of God. And then, you know, one sort of overly reductive way to describe it is then in about the fourth century, then Constantine chose Christianity as a state religion. And then suddenly Christianity got mixed with empire and power. And then it kind of just turned on itself. And then it became about boundaries and who's in, who's out, walls, exclusion, kicking people out when they don't fit the right beliefs or behaviors. Okay. Check them back in here. Um, uh, I'm not sure what this is in reference to, Junior. He asks, what about the Quran where homosexuality is punishable by death? Is Islam therefore a harmful ideology? I, let me try and be as clear as I can. Any ideology or theology that tells gay people that they should be killed or should kill themselves or should force themselves to be celibate or should try to marry somebody of the opposite sex to see if it fixes everything. I don't care where it comes from. It's harmful. It's bad. It's wrong. Let's kick it off the face of the earth. So I'm not sure what your question was. I've got no problem judging teachings from the Quran as well as judging teaches teachings from the Christian scripture and the Jewish scripture and yeah so I don't care where the idea is nestled or who says it uh yeah it's a it's a it's a bad belief a hundred percent um I'm so glad massage works that really really makes me happy uh let's see Peter hey what's up bud glad you're here uh, you said per Andrew's statement is the goal not to be like Jesus. Um, I think that's a great goal. It's certainly my goal. I mean, that's when I described several weeks ago on here what I, you know, what it means to be a Christian to someone who follows in the way of Jesus. You are literally like following in the way of Jesus, like trying to be like him. That's what a disciple is. So that is my goal. Yes, 100%. It is my goal. I think it's a good goal. Um, thank you, Christian, for the positive feedback. Andrew, I love that you love Brene as well. Um, oh, Lenny, I love this. You lead an LGBTQ affirming small group and we just read through on Clobber. Ah, what a gift. What a gift. Life is awesome. Um, yes, the trauma is real, Mike. The, the trauma of people who told you that you were going to hell for being gay. But that was somehow love. I'm that's that's wrong. It's not okay. You didn't deserve it. And my hope is that you will find, if you haven't already, paths towards healing from that trauma. But it may always be there in some form. But I think the hope is that it can begin to have less and less of a sting over time. I'm sorry. We have another person who was knocked out of the bubble as a gay man. Man. We've really done a lot of damage, haven't we, church? Um, no, it was knowing that who I was being described as was not who I was. Yeah, can you, is there, there aren't too many things more painful than that when somebody keeps insisting that you are something other than what you are. Like, no, that's not what I am. Stop it. Um, but then Kevin goes on, coming out then caused loved ones. Um, oh, let me put that up there, the second paragraph there. Coming out then caused some loved ones out of the bubble, but I would have to admit it hurts when family are unable to reconcile that in their own faith journey. Uh, yeah, that does that does hurt, and I'm sorry. But I'm glad you're here a lot. Um, so, Junior, you're coming back to the whole punishable by death thing. I don't see what the relevance there is because also Leviticus 20 talks about it's a, a, a man a male shall not lie with a male as with a the langs of a wife they shall be put to death like and it, as i've shown in many other times many other places um 
that doesn't say what we've thought it should be said. So I'm, I'm just not sure what your, what your question is. Um, you're, you're asking if beliefs are harmful. Yes. Beliefs, those beliefs are harmful. Um, Okay, so here, let's go back to this. Try to get us back on topic here, Andrew. How do you navigate a conflict of authorities? Example, becoming like Jesus, if this is your goal, versus something that would be opposite the life or teachings of Jesus. I can only... I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I don't... I don't know why I would opt in to an idea or a teaching or a value as authoritative if it was contradictory to the way of Jesus. So I'm trying to even imagine what an example of that would be. So if, if there's any specific example, Andrew, that comes to mind, then maybe we can address that. But for me, it's like, why if someone like myself identifies as a Christian and tries to live in the way of Jesus, why would they then adopt an authoritative truth that is in direct contradiction to that? I don't, I just don't know that that scenario would happen. So then to your question is how would you navigate that? Kind of like what we said at the very top of the show, welcome to life. Like welcome to life as a human being where we're constantly trying to navigate conflicting values. And sometimes we have to just nudge one up over more than another. And it doesn't mean we don't value the other thing. It just means, crap, we got to choose. Um, I see some positive love and encouragement in the comments here. Y'all are so wonderful. Um, oh, we got a history major in the house. Uh, suddenly I'm nervous. How am I doing? No, don't answer that. I like I like the I like the story that I tell myself, which is that I'm just knowledgeable enough in other fields to be dangerous. <laughs> Ooh, Peter, this is so good. After being excommunicated twice, there is trauma, but you can heal. Thank you for sharing that. That testimony is everything. Everything. Um. All right, Junior. I see that you and Mandy are going back and forth and I will just say, be respectful, Junior. Um, this is a, a, a space that is and will always be safe and loving, um, primarily for those who identify LGBTQ. So keep it civil, keep it kind. Um, I haven't had a chance to read in detail all of what you said, so maybe you are, and that's great. I just want to make that real clear. Um, but anyway, okay, this is great. Um, it's almost three o'clock and I like to try to keep these things under 60 minutes. So I will um, sign off here in just a minute. I just want to one more time invite everybody to come back tonight at 7 p.m. on the Kate and Colby show. We do it live, uh, just similar to this really, um, on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, and we are having special guest Brian McLaren join us tonight. So Brian is way over on the East Coast, so it's going to be super late for him. But he said, yeah, I don't mind staying up and joining y'all super late. Uh, so we're going to talk to him about his new book, Faith After Doubt, which I have three copies to give away. And the way that you win one is you show up live and then follow the steps on that we will provide to tell you how to win. Uh, and then finally, as well, I just want to remind everybody that if you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't yet hit that subscribe button. I would love it if you would do that. And same thing if you're watching this on the Facebooks, if you would click like on my page, that would help both of us out. That's a win and a win. Um, and one more question, Peter, uh, the gifts of imperfection would be a great place to start. Uh, or, you know, to even get into the world of Brene, go watch her TED Talk I think her first TED talk, which probably has like three gajillion views at this point about the power of vulnerability uh, would be a great place to start. But then the gifts of imperfection is fantastic. Um, and kind of, you can just go from there, but Brene is, Brene is wonderful. All right. Uh, this has been great. I love you all. I'm really honored to get to spend this time with you and I will hopefully see you next. Well, I'll be here. I just mean, hopefully you'll be here as well next Wednesday, 2 PM. Peace out.
If you'd like to sign up to get my weekly newsletter, Perspective Shift, where I examine life through a mixed lens of progressive Christianity, psychology, and spirituality, simply head over to colbymartin.substack.com. Enter your email address and click subscribe. And once you're in, you'll see that all my past articles are here. And don't worry, you don't have to do anything about missing anything because every new edition of the newsletter goes directly to your inbox. And periodically, I'll hop on the Facebook Live here and do a live reading of a past article. So just make sure that you go to facebook.com slash colbymartinauthor. And then if you haven't already, you click this little guy here and you like my page. That way, Facebook will say, hey, guess what? Colby's going live. Thanks for tuning in.